Hi guys, this is our first video for vertebrate natural history. This one's on vertebrate basics, so we're going to cover um, some things in general here that we'll get into more specifically as we go through the different taxa of vertebrates through the semester. At the beginning of each video, I'll give you a slide like this that tells you by the end of the video what you should be able to do. Um, this is a good guide for taking notes, so by the end of the video, you want to make sure that you understand these things and have some notes written down on each of these. So for this video, um, you want to focus on evolutionary history of vertebrates, common vertebrate characteristics, adaptations in their function and evolution, temperature regulation, and locomotion in vertebrates. So I'm going to start off with just a real quick timeline of um, the Earth and life on Earth. So the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. That's pretty old. And um, the oldest evidence of life on Earth was about 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. So there's been life on Earth for most of the time the Earth has existed. But vertebrates didn't come around until about 600 million years ago, which is way up here. Uh, land animals, even more recent, 400 million years ago. Dinosaurs, 200 million years ago. Mammals and birds, not until 150 million years ago. Uh, and then the first hominid, that um, is a human-like primate. They were just 4 million years ago. And Homo sapiens, so that's humans, um, first came on the scene about 500,000 years ago, which and this whole timeline is just a little sliver of it at the very, very end. So we're very recent. Um, just kind of gives you an idea, puts things in perspective a little bit. So throughout this course, you're going to be learning the classification of a number of different species. You'll need to know the full classification of a bunch of them. And that full classification is going from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And the genus species is um, the scientific name. And sometimes you'll have um, subphyla or um, subclasses, things like that, kind of extra levels in there. But all vertebrates are in the animal kingdom. So there's five different kingdoms. There's Monera, Fungi, Protista, Plant and Animal. Monera, that's um, like bacteria, fungi, things like mushrooms, yeast. Protista, that's algae and um, protozoan, slime molds. And I think you're familiar with plants and animals. So we're focusing just on the animal kingdom and even more specifically just on the phylum chordata and the subphylum vertebrata. So not all chordates vertebrates. There's some other kind of weird things like the sea squirts and the lancelets that are chordates but not vertebrates. So we're focusing just on subphylum vertebrata for this entire class um, and we're going to kind of work our th way through the different taxa of that subphylum. This picture is kind of hard to see. I'm sorry. It's from your book though so you should have it. Um, and this is showing a cladogram and a cladogram is one of the ways that uh, evolutionary relationships between organisms can be shown and so this one is showing relationships between all the different taxa of vertebrates from agnatha those are like jawless fish all of, so here are the agnathans all the way up through uh, mammals and when you're kind of reading one of these cladograms you want to look at these V's at the um, kind of intersection or the bottom point of the V, that shows a common ancestor between everything on each of the two sides of the V. So right here is representing a common ancestor between all these guys, frogs, salamanders, Sicilians, and um, all these guys over here, the turtles, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, birds, and mammals. So somewhere back in time, here around here there was a common ancestor. Now the smaller the V, see how this V is pretty small, this V is really small, that means that the um, that the relationship between these two organisms is is very close, more closely related than something like a big V like this. So those are kind of things that you're looking at to analyze these clades. There's some other representations of evolutionary relationships too. This one is more of a timeline, so you have an idea of when these um, divergences happen. So if I said, well, when did reptiles kind of branch off from amphibians? You can look right here and you would say, oh, during the Carboniferous period, about you know, 325 million years ago. Um, but it's still showing the, the branchings and um, at the intersections that's where we have 
uh, common ancestors. So you should be able to um, kind of interpret um, graphics. So there's a few characteristics that are common to all vertebrates. They have vertebrae or a backbone. They also have a brain case or a cranium. They have cartilage or bone or both. So some things like sharks just have cartilage, other things only have bone, and a lot of vertebrates have both. Most of them have paired appendages. Things like our arms, we have two of them, they're paired. Um, our uh, fish's pectoral fins, those are paired appendages. And limb girdles, so things like our pelvis. Uh, the pharyngeal clefts are present in the embryos of all vertebrates. Those are sometimes called gill slits. And so in early embryonic development, you can see those in all vertebrates. But later in development, in many vertebrates, they disappear or they become other structures. Um, whereas in fish, they'll become the gills, so they kind of look the same throughout development. There's crazy diversity among vertebrates. Um, we're going to look at a couple of the different ways that vertebrates are so diverse. First of all, just the size. There are some fish and frogs that are less than a centimeter in length, so itty bitty bitty tiny. Whereas you go up to the blue whale and they can be 30 meters, 170,000 kilograms in size. African elephant, also huge, up to 5,000 kilograms. Another type of diversity is the wide variety of habitats that vertebrates inhabit. There are vertebrates at the poles, the polar bear, there are vertebrates in the driest and hottest deserts, um, like the horned lizards. We've got a red-eyed tree frog there living in a very moist, warm uh, tropical rainforest. This dude right here, this guy is crazy. It's called a barrel fish. They can live up to 2,000 meters down deep in the sea. And so they have this crazy uh, transparent head where you can see their eyes. Their eyes point straight up. And this part kind of glows. And so they it illuminates prey that are above them and the, um, they don't see the prey per se, they just kind of see a shadow. When they see the shadow of something that might be prey, they turn vertical and they eat their prey from below. So that's kind of freaky. Um, and then this here, last picture, is a golden eagle living on a cliff that most vertebrates could not survive on. So the point of all this is that different vertebrates have different adaptations. Um, adaptations are characteristics that persist, persist in a population through natural selection. What that means is that it's characteristic that um, that was in a population, but in a population there's variation, especially in populations that reproduce sexually. You get variation in traits, variation in the gene pool, and so um, not all the individuals of a population look the same and have the same characteristics. And because of that variation, some of those traits are going to be um, better for survival and reproduction than others. And over time, those that are um, that improve survival and reproduction are those that are going to persist in the population because so those are the individuals that are surviving and reproducing, and those are the ones passing on their genes. So over time, you're going to see those traits in the population more and more. Um, because of their um, increasing the fitness of the population. And so sometimes you see some kind of crazy characteristics like how the male seahorse gestates the babies and give, the male gives live birth to baby seahorses. This is a Jesus fish running on water. Um, this is a long-eared bat with these crazy ears for echolocation. It's a poison dart frog that has toxic secretions. Um, to kind of scare off predators. And as a peregrine falcon, they can dive at insane speeds. Um, so these are just some examples of really cool adaptations. Um, but I want you to be able to think this throughout the whole semester, no matter what taxa we're talking about, we're going to see different characteristics. And when you see a characteristic of an animal, I want you to think, well, what adaptation does that have? Why does this organism have teeth like this? Why does it... Um, have a tail like this, what kind of adaptive advantage would it be giving this species um, related to its fitness, especially over evolutionary time. I want to make a note that vestigial structures are different from adaptations. So vestigial structures are things that um, 
<clears throat> they're structures that are reduced or eliminated over evolutionary time because they're not used. And so an example is um, the eyes of cave fish. Cave fish live in complete darkness in the water of caves. And so over time, <clears throat> their eyes weren't used. They don't need to see. They live in complete darkness. So over time, they got more and more reduced. Um, and it's not so much that not seeing or not having eyes is an advantage for them for survival and reproduction. It's just that it's not needed. So um, in that way, the vestigial structures, it's a little bit different than an adaptation. I want to talk about a couple different types of um, adaptation, specifically temp temperature regulation, first of all. Um, poikilothermy is um, when an animal has a variable body temperature, whereas homeothermy is when the body temperature remains relatively constant. And then ectothermy is when body heat is acquired from the environment, as opposed to endothermy when body heat is derived from metabolism, <coughs> so from the organism's own body. Now normally we associate ectothermy with poikilothermy and homeothermy with endothermy, but there's some exceptions. Think about uh, mammals that hibernate. So they are endothermic, right? Mammals make their own body heat, but when they hibernate their temperature can drop dozens and dozens of degrees, so that's pretty variable. So they're endotherms that are poikilothermic. And then um, Crocodiles and alligators, reptiles, so they are ectothermic, their body heat is acquired from the environment, but they have a number of adaptations that make them pretty homeothermic. Their body temperature will only vary about two or three degrees. Um, so knowing those four terms and knowing that it's not necessarily, um, you know, they're not necessarily synonymous to each other is important. Another type of adaptation is locomotion. So just a few of the types of locomotion are listed here. There's some more listed in your book, but just being familiar with these basics is important. Some vertebrates travel on land, terrestrial, some in the air, aerial. Some of them jump, saltatorial, or some travel through trees, arboreal. We also have aquatic. There's a lot of, you can go on and on. I'm getting more and more specific with the types of locomotion in vertebrates. Um, but again, thinking about the adaptations for each. Why does this, um, why does the organism, why has it evolved um, this kind of adaptation? How is it an adaptive advantage for them to jump or to fly or to glide or to run on two or four feet? So I want you to now kind of revisit these five points that we laid out at the beginning of the video. Make sure that you have some notes on each of them. Um, if you have questions, we'll have maybe some time in class, but also you can email me or there's going to be a place for questions on Moodle. Um, so I want to make sure that you get all these points and that you have a chance to ask questions if you have any. And then to wrap it up, just a little humor. We, we can't be entirely sure. We can hypothesize um, what factors led to um, to different kind of changes in, over evolutionary time. So why did those lobe fin fish come out of the water and and um, adapt to living on land? Um, Gary Larson has one hypothesis here. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, have a, a great night. I look forward to seeing you in class.